This is a story of greed and gold. The quest for a mysterious treasure called Yamashita's gold, named after the legendary Japanese general who made his last stand in the mountains of the northern Philippines as the Second World War drew to a close. The story goes that before his defeat, Yamashita ordered his troops to bury a fortune in gold that the Imperial Army had looted from Asia. Some say it was the largest treasure hoard in history. Japan had amassed huge quantities of treasure, far in excess of anything that the Third Reich assembled during World War II. No witnesses were supposed to be left alive to reveal where the treasure was buried, but one Filipino claims to have lived to tell the tale. There are so many soldiers inside. They are drinking wine, sake, bansai, bansai, bansai. When we were inside the tunnel, when we go out, I hear a boom, boom, boom. For treasure hunters, Yamashita's gold represents the ultimate dream of fabulous wealth. But some say the treasure is no more than a myth. For decades, treasure hunters from across the globe have combed the islands in search of the elusive plunder. But for every hard fact about the treasure, there's a wealth of rumour and speculation. The treasure hunters keep digging. Many are backed by rich investors and equipped with high-tech electronics. For them, treasure hunting is a full-time profession. First time we came to the Philippines, we brought over a handheld metal detector, and my partner brought along a set of scales to weigh the gold with that we were going to recover in six weeks, and that was 15 years ago. So, um, so have you found anything in those 15 years? Electronically speaking, we have, but something that you can hold in your hand, very little. The quantities that people talk about over here, I mean, are mind-boggling. You're talking not tons, but hundreds of tons of gold. From the early 1930s onwards, Japanese forces marched through Asia, spreading down from Manchuria, through China to Southeast Asia, and on to the archipelagos of the Southern Pacific. Japan itself possessed few resources. With an army of over two million men to support, they needed plunder of all kinds to sustain their expansionism, food, raw materials, and treasure. And Asia was a storehouse of riches. For thousands of years, gold had been the currency of power and the symbol of splendor. Hunters for Yamashita's gold say that vast amounts of this Asian loot were buried in the Philippines. They say they have the evidence to prove it. Coded maps of Japanese treasure sites. Gold bars and artifacts discovered across the islands.
30 years ago, one Filipino treasure hunter said he'd unearthed the solid gold Buddha, part of Yamashita's private stash. In the 1990s, this Buddha was the subject of a major court case, resulting in a $22 billion judgment, one of the largest in legal history. Many of the people that go treasure hunting in the Philippines know perfectly well that the story is true. There are those that are, imagine that the Yamashita's treasure is a glorious legend and it's fun and wouldn't it be fun to go do this? But there are others that know perfectly well that gold has been recovered there, large quantities of gold. Books and internet websites have helped to spread the story of Yamashita's gold, mixing historical fact with speculation. The magic of the story lies in its promise of immense fairy tale wealth a promise that's particularly powerful in a country like the Philippines. For most people here, the one certainty is poverty. Uh, one reason why this treasure legend appeals to a lot of Filipinos is because, uh, well, life is generally hard in the Philippines. Uh, there's a lot of poverty, there are peasants who hardly can make ends meet. And because of that, get-rich-quick schemes are very, very popular here. Whether it be gambling, whether it be uh, hunting for treasure, whether it be doing anything else to make a quick buck. One way of making a quick buck is to give the treasure hunters what they want. The Filipino people have a vested interest in keeping the saga going. Buying a treasure map in the Philippines is a tantamount to buying a See the Stars home maps in Hollywood. You can buy it on any corner. They like this. It brings money in their, into their economy. Their workers are employed in digging. The money of the investors is spent in their hotels and in their other enterprises. And it is a cottage industry. Once you start looking for gold, it's difficult to stop. The great discovery is always just around the corner. Uh, this is a World War II burial site. Uh, the hole number one was the first one we started up above. Uh, we're at 70 feet there now, continuing down, uh, looking for a cave in this particular area. And this was the last stronghold of the Japanese. So we believe that they were transferring gold in here, then blowing the caves, and hopefully they'd come back years later and retrieve it. Well, they believe, the workers down in the hole, that they've gotten close to a cave entrance or part of the cave itself. So it's very interesting now. It's a good time to be up here, I'm sure, even for you. Hmm? The truth about Jamashta's gold may be buried under layers of rumour and speculation. But the origins of the story lie in historical fact, Japan's conquest and exploitation of Asia. In the 1930s, Japan was facing a severe economic uh, downturn. So there was a growing sense in Japan that unless they expanded militarily, that they would be facing the prospect of not only mass unemployment, but perhaps even starvation. So they began to look towards China 
as the solution to their problems. In 1931, Japan seized the province of Manchuria and began stripping it of resources. Six years later, imperial troops attacked the nationalist capital of Nanking, slaughtering tens, some say hundreds of thousands of civilians in a massacre that became known as the Rape of Nanking. Reports of Japanese brutality shocked the world. Yet the scale of Japanese looting received far less attention. When I was researching my book, I came across literally hundreds of references of Japanese looting in the city, in wartime diaries, um, in missionary accounts. There were stories of the Japanese uh, breaking into embassies, churches, uh, schools, uh, banks, and systematically plundering whatever they found there. One of those who witnessed Japanese behavior at the time was an American academic, a history professor at Nanking University. Practically every building in the city was entered many, many times by roving gangs of soldiers throughout the first six or seven weeks of the occupation. In some cases, the looting was well organized and systematic, using fleets of army trucks under the direction of officers. The vaults in the banks, including the personal safe deposit boxes of German officials and residents, were cut open with acetylene torches. The pattern was repeated again and again over the years as the Japanese advanced. Philip Olenschlager recalls what happened at his father's bank in the Dutch East Indies when the Japanese arrived. Now, when the Japanese uh, had invaded Malaysia, and Malaysia had fallen, then the bank, which had a headquarters in, in Batavia, which is now Jakarta, moved the gold reserves to the more central bank location of Bandung. Bandung is the central part of West Java. So all the gold reserves of the then colonial bank of Indonesia, called the Javasa Bank, were all in the folds of the bank in Bandung. And my father was one of the directors at the bank. And there, the Japanese did put their hands on the gold in the folds. That gold was left in the folds and was taken by the Japanese. But also in the folds where all the private property, jewels, some gold, I guess, but mainly jewels, of the people living in the Bandung area and also some which had come from Batavia. And bear in mind that Bandung was the center of the textile industry in all of Asia at the time. So there were very rich, mainly Chinese people there who had put all their, their property and jewels in the folds in the bank in, uh, in, in Bandung. And that was taken by the Japanese. So it was very definitely a concerted effort to, to, to rob the country. The looting was widespread and systematic, and it wasn't just perpetrated by the military. In some cases, it was carried out in collaboration with Japanese gangsters, the Yakuza. One of the key figures involved in this looting was Yoshio Kadama, a right-wing ultra-nationalist with links to the Yakuza. Kadama was given special military status in order to assist the imperial forces in acquiring war plunder. Kodama turns up in Shanghai and begins a series of activities that would make him one of the most powerful men in Japan. Kodama founds a, a, an agency called Kodama Kikan, literally the Kodama Agency, and it has an exclusive contract to buy strategic materials for the Japanese Navy's Air Force. Uh, well, uh, this gives Kodama an open license at gunpoint to take strategic materials from all corners of China. Uh, U.S. intelligence believed that, that his assets were worth some $175 million U.S. by the end of the war. Now bear in mind, this is in 1945, $175 million, this is a fortune. Kodama sees this in his writings as an idealistic enterprise to, to help to do his part for the war effort. Others might charitably call it looting. Millions of dollars' worth of precious metals were seized by men like Kodama, ready to be shipped back to Japan. But just how much treasure did the Japanese take? And what happened to it?
American author Sterling Seagrave believes that thousands of tons of gold were buried in secret sites across the Philippines, and that the whole operation, codenamed Golden Lily, was masterminded by the Japanese imperial family, including the emperor. Regardless of the consequences of Japan's military actions on the mainland, the imperial family wanted to be absolutely certain that they were enriched and that Japan was enriched. It was the economic side of the military campaign. We know that there were 175 imperial treasure sites, and these sites have marked on them the quantity of gold that was hidden in each vault. They had hidden $100 billion, $1945 worth of treasure in the Philippines. But other writers on Japan contest this account. They say that insufficient evidence exists to support it. I think it's a myth. I think it's part of the, the legends of the Pacific War, uh, and indeed of the war in East Asia generally. And there certainly is no doubt that there was a huge amount of treasure that was accumulated in occupied territories. Does that mean that huge quantities of these treasures then remain secreted all over East Asia? Well, who knows? Japan needed vast resources to continue its war. By the eve of World War II, half the country's gold reserves had been spent. The logic of their own expansionism drove the Japanese to one last throw of the dice. A great triumph that turned into an even greater disaster. December the 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. But less than six months after Pearl Harbor, Japan lost the Battle of Midway and control of the Pacific. The way the Yamashita Gold story tells it, the Japanese, their treasure ships now threatened, turned to a new harbor. During Japan's march across Asia, war plunder was seized and shipped home. After 1941, much of that loot, it's thought, traveled via the Philippines, the key staging post for ocean-going vessels en route from conquered Southeast Asia to Japan. For supporters of the Yamashita's gold story, the trail leads to the Philippines because of its pivotal position within the orbit of Japanese conquest. They use Manila as a staging area because this was one of the principal command posts. In Manila, they would offload the cargo so that the same ships could go back and continue to transport stuff from Singapore or Java, wherever, up to Manila. And then they would load the treasure certain of the more desirable treasure onto Japanese ships that were returning to Japan either for repairs, if they were military vessels, or in the case of cargo ships, they would come down loaded with material and then they would go back loaded with treasure. No one knows how much war loot reached Japan. By the end of 1942, American naval forces were taking control of the sea routes to the home islands. That made it uh, a ticklish situation for the Japanese because the war was turning against them. They recognized, many of them recognized, that they would lose the war militarily. And they had all this treasure sitting in warehouses in the Philippines. What were they going to do with it? If they couldn't ship it further north, they had to hide it. If you assume that the treasure was in the Philippines and had to be hidden, there were many potential hiding places. The capital, Manila, had grown up around a Spanish garrison, Fort Santiago, with mazes of tunnels and underground storerooms. 
and they went to extraordinary lengths. They began this by using the old Spanish ruins and the old Spanish cathedrals in the Philippines, the ruins being some of the old forts. The cathedrals were well maintained, but underneath them they often had catacombs, which were ready-made places to stash gold bullion. The Japanese were efficient military engineers. They dug tunnels and bunkers across the Philippines. Filipinos were often put to work on the construction of these tunnels. We were made to dig six tunnels in the side of the mountain. We dug about nine feet or three meters into the rock. Then we constructed a chamber at the end of the tunnels. I don't know if the Japanese put treasure inside these tunnels. If they did, it would have been a lot of treasure. The Japanese were facing a desperate final battle for the Philippines. They brought in the so-called Tiger of Malaya, General Tomoyuki Yamashita, who had captured Singapore early in the war. Bunkers and tunnels were needed for storage, transport, and defensive strongholds. But is it possible that these excavations had another use? The Japanese army was all over the Philippines during the war. And towards the end of the war, they had to withdraw to certain strategic areas. And when they holed up in the mountainous areas, they brought everything with them. So that means they brought in all their valuables, they brought in Japanese civilians who were afraid of being attacked by Filipinos, and the Japanese civilians also brought their valuables with them. So we don't know what valuables the Japanese civilians did, but they probably have had gold, jewels and stuff. So this combined with what they had gotten in the banks and the other institutions, all of these were brought to the mountains. And there had to be concealed there somewhere concealed in drums, in vases, concealed in pots, buried in tunnels, in caves, or anywhere else. Again, no one knows how much Japanese treasure was buried, but one extraordinary eyewitness does confirm that some was. Minoru Sato was a young Japanese officer serving in the Philippines during World War II. As the war drew to a close, he was ordered to transport several boxes to a remote location. The military police headquarters in Manila contacted my unit as the war reached a critical stage. I took one of my men and went to headquarters in a truck. There we were given charge of a box of machine gun ammunition and two other boxes. So we took the two boxes on our backs and set off up into the mountains. Eventually we came to a cave. We thought this was the ideal place to hide the boxes. But I was curious to know what was inside. So I used my bayonet to break open the lid. We were surprised to find the box was not full of material necessary for the war effort. It was packed to the very brim with jewellery, and there was a small crown of pure gold. Then we opened the other box. When I pulled back the top, I saw it contained gold bars. They weren't very big. I didn't check their weight, but they were about this thick. The main source for the story of buried treasure is not Japanese, but Filipino. During the Japanese occupation, many young Filipinos worked for the Imperial Army as interpreters, cooks, valets, or slave labor. Now in their 80s and 90s, some of them earn a living as pointers, 
taking foreign treasure hunters to sites where they maintained the Japanese had buried treasure. Ben Valmores is a pointer. You see the sign there? You, you see the sign there? Yeah. It's a big X, and there is a hole there. The hole was put, uh, there. they put some gold inside that hole there. So the Japanese get that, uh, tap it and get the gold. I've worked with most uh, pointers or whatever you want to call them. Uh, a couple of, I will not name, but they're very well known in this area. Very shifty people. Ben is one of the most down-to-earth, honest men. What are you looking for, Ben? Uh, the sign of the Japanese, a small sign. They wrote a sign on the rock? Yeah, yes, sir. That's why I'm looking here already. Ah, yes, this one. Uh, down and up, here. Here, sir. Mm -hmm. Here, sir, the signs going proceed up and then proceed down. He is 100% consistent in what he says. He'll always look you in the eye. I was at a site with him earlier this morning and he pointed up towards us and said there was a cave behind us. Uh, he had not been in that, with me in that part of the area and we already knew that there was a cave behind us, but he couldn't see it. And he was standing down below where the cave had started. Ben Valmores is a key source whose eyewitness account, if true, confirms one version of the Yamashita's gold story. According to this version, the Japanese imperial family took charge of the Asian loot. They worked through a top-secret organization called Golden Lily, and towards the end of the war, they buried billions of dollars worth of gold at 175 sites across the Philippines. At the time, Valmores was a teenager in the northern Philippines. He states that a young Japanese man he knew as Kimsu Marakusi took him on as his personal valet. He further says that Kimsu was in charge of the treasure burials and that he was a relative of the Emperor Hirohito. Kimsu came to us and then he says, Me, says, me, Hirohito, like that. But who exactly was Valmore's mysterious Kim Su? We discovered that um, Ben's prince was named Prince Takeda Suniyoshi. He was a first cousin of Emperor Hirohito and a grandson of the Meiji Emperor. A very handsome, debonair, well-educated man in his 30s. He came to the Philippines and effectively was put in charge of hiding all the treasure out in the countryside while Prince Chichibu was supervising sites in and around Manila. And it was Prince Takeda that Ben accompanied during the inventories. The gold is already inside. We just go down only with Kim Su and the others down there and then we will go straight there and follow then when we return it. There are so, so many files already. It is already filed. I didn't see that they bring down the boxes inside. Ben is the only one who was present with the princes throughout much of the war and who actually went to all 175 imperial sites. Val Morris states that in the final days of the war, the prince and General Yamashita, the commander of Japanese forces on the islands, concealed one last hoard of gold deep inside a huge tunnel complex. According to Valmores, he was meant to be left inside to die, buried alive with the soldiers. Instead, the prince spared him. Yamashita told that I will be left here, and Kim Su says, no. Left in the tunnel? You go. And then he said, you go. Yamashita said you should be left in the tunnel? Mm -hmm. Why did he say that? I don't know, so that nobody will know, maybe this one. Come on! Hey, come by! And then suddenly, and I hear a bomb, boom, and so I dive. I dive to the ground.
when I look up, I see them bow their head. No more. Valmores adds that before his departure, the prince, fearing he might die at sea, left him some personal possessions, including maps to all the imperial sites. Valmores says he was supposed to look after these until the return of the prince or one of his representatives. Uh, we are to separate already. So I'll get my uniform that I leave it to you and my sword, give it to you, and then keep it. I will come back and get it. And then he says to me, well, Benjamin, he says, I see his eyes already, that's becoming red, and there is already water coming out. And then says, sayonara. Valmore's story has made him a valuable asset to treasure hunters over the decades. And there are so many tunnels going there, going to this place. And the Japanese are putting there, there is a hole there, that they are putting a box inside. His apparently unique knowledge has reassured established investors and attracted new ones. In treasure hunt publicity, the hunters are regularly on the verge of amazing finds and just as regularly held up by unforeseen obstacles, booby traps, geological difficulties, equipment failures. To me, those reports are very important because investors, if they know what's going on, they feel more comfortable with it, uh, they're willing to increase their investment and it will, will you'll get new investors in. So the, the updates they put out is very important. You'd like to know where your investment is and what's happening. Some of the people who have looked for the treasure have lived very well off of never finding anything. People will invest in the promise of a possibility of a maybe and they live off of that hope. And the investors want to make a thousand times their money back. I, I just believe they took it there. And, and I've talked to, you know, some of the older Philippine workers my age that helped, you know, that helped bury it. But the hard evidence for Valmore's story is sparse. He no longer has the artifacts allegedly left him by the prince. He says that years of wear ruined the uniform and sword, and that the maps were stolen from him. Valmores is said to have picked out his prints from a lineup of photographs in a specially prepared test. He instantly identified Prince Takeda. And in fact, he, it stopped him cold. He hadn't seen the prints since 1945, so half a century had passed. And he was so moved, the tears came in his eyes, and he immediately began crooning Sakura Sakura, which is a Japanese folk song of cherry blossoms, which he said Takeda used to sing all the time. The test was supervised by the Filipino wife of one of the treasure hunters. Seagrave supplied the photographs, but was not present. How much of Valmore's story is true, how much fiction? Okay. It came to him and they talked together already. Were his tunnels really treasure burial sites, or were they simply part of the Imperial Army's defences? As American forces swept towards the Philippines, Japanese troops were digging in. They knew this would be the final battle and that they would be heavily outnumbered.
By the summer of 1944, it was clear to the Japanese that an American invasion of the Philippines was imminent. They prepared to make a last stand. The general in charge of the islands was relieved and replaced by one of Japan's most successful wartime soldiers, General Tomoyuki Yamashita. Once the Americans landed, Yamashita withdrew from Manila to the mountains in the north, around the regional capital, Baggio. The main strategy that the Japanese had by late 1944 and 1945 was to tie down as many American soldiers as they could, prevent them from landing on Japan. So what they did was they holed up in certain areas in the mountains. Colonel Harry Fukuhara was a Japanese-American intelligence officer who fought Yamashita's forces in the Philippines. General Yamashita's forces were well entrenched. They had um, several months of preparation to dig tunnels. Their entire headquarters was underground. They were uh, uh, prepared for our uh, trying to take Baguio. And uh, so they were uh, determined to fight to the end. In the north, the bitter fighting continued for almost a year. Meanwhile, down south, outside Yamashita's immediate area of control, Japanese marines in the Philippines' capital, Manila, massacred approximately 60,000 civilians. Eventually, in September 1945, Yamashita's forces surrendered. For some, the surrender opened the way for a conspiracy involving Yamashita's gold. These theorists argue that General Douglas MacArthur recovered a good deal of the gold in the Philippines and, along with American intelligence services and the Japanese royal family, spun a web of deceit that still obscures the truth today. One piece of evidence they rely on is the fact that almost as soon as General Yamashita surrendered, he was put on trial for war crimes, the first enemy commander in any theater of the Second World War to face such a charge. Approximately 60,000 unarmed men, women, and children were killed in the Philippine Islands by men under your command. There was only one simple charge, which was that he failed to exercise effective command of his of forces which committed war crimes, and that therefore he was responsible. I never heard of, nor do I, did I know of these events. There was a great deal of haste in the trial. The proceedings only lasted just over a month from the 29th of, of October, 1945. Uh, so it was a very early trial when feelings were very, very high uh, until the 5th of December. Uh, and then the, the judges decided that they were going to reach a judgment on the basis of some 4,000 odd pages of transcripts and 400 odd exhibits. They were going to reach their, their judgment on this in about 46 hours, uh, which is a remarkably short time. And in view of the aggravated nature of the crime. Journalists and legal experts observing the case were surprised by the speed of the trial. General MacArthur had been humiliated by the Japanese victory in the Philippines earlier in the war. Some felt he was looking for a quick revenge. 
and there may have been a symbolic reason for the haste of the proceedings. So the interest of speeds would be difficult to quite understand, except that judgment was duly given on a rather pregnant date, one that lives in infamy, as they say, the 7th of December, 1945. Accordingly, upon secret written ballot, two-thirds or more of the members concurring, the commission finds you guilty as charged and sentences you to death by hanging, the accused members of the defense staff, Japanese members of the defense staff, will be escorted from the courtroom. General Yamashita, I think, uh, if, uh, if, if Japan had won the war, I think he would be probably the top hero of Japan. But when you, when you don't win a war, if you lose a war, you, you don't have heroes. Some believers in the treasure story allege that the real reason for Yamashita's hasty execution may have been his knowledge that US forces were opening up some of the imperial treasure sites. According to them, US intelligence agents working for MacArthur had already learned of the existence of the gold during the long years of the Japanese occupation. The truth about all of this is that there was a hidden agenda. What was really going on was that MacArthur's men were at this very moment, during the trial, busily occupied recovering billions, hundreds perhaps, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of gold, and they knew that there were a great many more sites yet to be uncovered after that. So it's self-evident that the reason to get rid of Yamashita was to get rid of the man who would know that you had done this. Others are less convinced, however, that Yamashita was involved in any treasure burials. I would venture to say that, that because of the limited amount of time that he had in, in the Philippines, uh, because of the uh, frenetic nature of, of, what he, of the tasks that he had to do in a purely military sense, um, I think it's highly unlikely that he would have given much attention uh, to the disposition of vast amounts of treasure, both on, on the basis of the evidence given in his trial by his defense and indeed from the evidence that we've seen on the prosecution side, it's quite clear that to suggest that there was some kind of a coherent plan to, uh, to collect all of this material together during his period, I think, is fanciful. But assuming the gold existed, what evidence is there that American forces recovered it? And what happened to it if they did? One piece of evidence that believers in Yamashita's gold site is the will of a Filipino businessman, Severino Santa Romana. He died in 1974, and his will suggests that he was rich, fabulously, unbelievably rich. On paper, he left his friends and family over $600 million, a mere fraction of his supposed wealth. The question is, where did his money come from? The mystery of Santa Romana's wealth has, like Yamashita's gold, given birth to its own series of legends and competing stories. There are several possible explanations, but the most dramatic one is that Santa Romana worked for US intelligence in the Philippines during the war. That the gold recovered by US intelligence forces at the end of the war was placed in special bank accounts around the world and used for Cold War covert operations. And that Santa Romana held the key to those accounts. As proof, Seagrave cites many gold bullion deposit accounts registered in the name of Santa Romana or one of his many aliases. Effectively, Santa Romana was the gatekeeper, the man who controlled the gold from the time it came out of the tunnels or vaults to the time it was deposited in various banks in many different countries around the world. Under CIA cover, uh, he was essentially a CIA agent his entire life after World War II. 
for Seagrave, persuasive confirmation of this came from a now-dead CIA source, the agency's former deputy director, Ray Klein. Arlene Friedman is a Los Angeles private detective who worked for a law firm on a Japanese war loot case originating from the Philippines. She interviewed some 350 witnesses over a period of six years, including the CIA's Ray Klein. There was a lot of allegations about the CIA involvement or OSS involvement. Ray Klein was a charming gentleman, looks just like Santa Claus. Talked to us for two hours, I took two hours of notes and basically said nothing. He did not confirm or deny anything. The closest he came uh, when I asked, is it possible that any of money in Manila was used for covert operations? Uh, Ray Klein said, without even confirming or denying, let's use a little intelligence here. If you are a covert organization, you don't go to the US Congress and ask for an appropriation of money for covert activity. Obviously, the CIA has money that they use for covert activities. The link between Yamashita's gold and the CIA remains open to doubt. Despite the efforts of many claimants, including relatives of Santa Romana, no one has yet publicly admitted to getting gold out of a Santa Romana account. As with Yamashita's gold, the money seems to remain, frustratingly, just out of reach and Santa Romana's money may have had nothing to do with Yamashita's gold. There's another, less sensational, explanation for his fortune. His name has been linked with that of Ferdinand Marcos, the former dictator of the Philippines. After his overthrow in 1986, Marcos was discovered to have billions in gold bullion secreted in bank accounts around the world. His opponents claim his immense fortune came from corruption and the looting of his country. Santa Romana money may, in the end, just be Marcos loot. Yet right up to his death, Marcos himself insisted that his money had come from a most surprising source, Yamashita's gold. To come, we investigate the legal battle over a golden Buddha, said to have been part of Yamashita's private hoard and later stolen by Marcos. And the tale of Marcos's own hunt for the Yamashita treasure. During World War II, Japanese troops under the command of the Imperial family and the legendary General Yamashita are said to have buried a fortune in treasure in the Philippines. The story goes that it was looted during the Japanese march across Asia. Some say it was the largest hoard in history. Today, treasure hunters comb the islands, searching for the fabled Yamashita's gold. The quantities that people talk about over here, I mean, are mind-boggling. You're talking not tons, but hundreds of tons of gold. You're chasing something that's a, that's a real dream. There's romance, adventure, excitement, and it allows grown men to be little boys again. I think it's almost a disease, this treasure hunting syndrome, uh, that, that uh, drives people to lose reason, and you have to really sit back and say, now, wait a minute. Well, it's a chance to, you know, get incredibly rich real quick. Uh, maybe 10 feet down, there's, you know, three or four hundred million dollars in metal somewhere. And if you dwell on that and you start thinking about it, you get really, really odd looking people. They get this thought and their eyes go glassy and they start smiling and it, just thinking about what's going to happen once they find this gold. And they're, 
another guy is down with gold fever. For treasure hunters, Yamashita's gold represents the ultimate dream of fabulous wealth. But there's another version of the story, how the mythology of the treasure has been exploited. Filipino dictator Ferdinand Marcos, some say, used the myth of Yamashita's gold to hide his theft of the Philippines' own resources. His widow is unrepentant. Tell the whole world, you know, Marcos is the biggest thief. Marcos is the biggest criminal. Marcos is this. Then afterwards, they will look for evidence. To this day, thanks God, they've found none. Rumors of a vast treasure left by the Japanese began to sweep the Philippines shortly after the war. The rumors have never died away. Books and internet websites have helped to spread the story of Yamashita's gold. Its most dramatic version claims that during the war, the Japanese imperial family masterminded an operation to loot the territories the Japanese had conquered, and that towards the end of the war, they buried hundreds of tons of stolen gold in sites throughout the Philippines. Sterling Seagrave, an American author, has spent a couple of decades investigating Yamashita's gold. We know that there were 175 imperial treasure sites, and these sites have marked on them the quantity of gold that was hidden in each vault. They had hidden $100 billion, $1945 worth of treasure in the Philippines. Some critics regard Seagrave's theories as speculation, but their origins unquestionably lie in historical fact. Japan's conquest and exploitation of Asia. From the early 1930s onwards, Japanese forces marched through Asia, spreading down from Manchuria, through China to Southeast Asia, and on to the archipelagos of the Southern Pacific. And wherever they went, they looted, systematically and ruthlessly. Initially, much of the war loot was returned to Japan. Then came Pearl Harbor. Within months, the war turned against Japan and US naval forces started to close off the sea routes to the home islands. Seagrave argues that there's evidence showing that Japanese imperial princes buried the treasure in the Philippines, one of the main staging posts within the orbit of Japan's conquests. In 1945, the story goes on, the Japanese faced defeat at the hands of the Americans. So the imperial family, now working with General Yamashita, who'd been made commander of Japanese forces in the Philippines, buried the last troves of treasure here. There were all these rumors that there was treasure concealed here. If, let's say, one native of the place finds one drum full of pre-war Philippine coins, the story can grow. As, as it goes on, people are very secretive about it, so it goes by word of mouth. And as it goes by word of mouth, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What's one drum becomes 10 drums, and what's 1,000 pesos becomes a million pesos by the time it reaches Manila. There's a lot of evidence that the Japanese buried some occupation valuables behind their lines. But this is very different from the full-blown Yamashita legend. Some say the Yamashita treasure's been recovered, but no one knows for certain. Amidst all the doubts, one name does crop up again and again, the former dictator of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos. Some believe he was the biggest and most successful treasure hunter of them all. 
For over two decades, Marcos ruled his country like a gangster. Bribery, corruption, and the torture and murder of political opponents were features of his regime. Marcos also built a vast personal fortune, much of it in gold. No one knows how much it was, but it's estimated to have been billions of dollars. Marcos's widow says that her late husband was always obsessed with gold. He had a fascination with gold even before the war and even before he finished uh, college in 1939. And he was already trading, working with gold mines. He was truly fascinated with gold because he thought gold was virtue, like virtue. Like many Filipinos, Marcos was also fascinated by legends of Yamashita's gold. In the late 60s, rumors began to circulate that Marcos had found the treasure, rumors that Marcos himself encouraged. Well, Marcos started out with less than $60,000 in assets according to his tax returns when he took over as president in 1966. In 1970, it became apparent he was making a lot more money than his presidential salary. And he called in the local press and said, do you know how I made my pile, boys? I found the treasure of Yamashita. Marcos claimed that he'd first got hold of maps to the Yamashita treasure as a guerrilla fighting the Japanese in the northern Philippines. Few believed him later on when he and his wife Imelda said that he'd actually found Yamashita's gold. Today, she tells a different tale. Sometimes in levity, he would say, oh, maybe, where did you get his money, you know? Uh, uh, because uh, maybe I got it, you know, Yamashita gold because they surrendered. But uh, in truth and in fact, uh, uh, it couldn't have been that because there was no such thing. But in 1971 came a discovery that indelibly linked Marcos's name with Yamashita's gold and appeared to provide concrete proof of the existence of the treasure itself. found a golden Buddha at three feet. The, high, the height is three feet and uh, the weight is one ton. Henry's father, Rogelio Rojas, a Filipino locksmith and treasure hunter, claimed to have found a solid gold Buddha in a tunnel behind a hospital in the former Japanese stronghold of Baggio. He believed the Buddha was part of Yamashita's private hoard. For a quarter of a century, treasure hunters had been searching for the gold. Now, here was a startling piece of evidence for the authenticity of the Yamashita's gold story. Rojas said that he'd been given a map by a former Japanese officer which showed the whereabouts of the Buddha. We know there's Buddha there because of the map, but to locate the entrance is really very hard. It took us 17 days because it is already blasted. So that is how we entered the body. We found the entrance of the tunnel. And you can remove the head of the golden Buddha and there is a uh, diamond inside, more or less two cups of diamond, a big diamond. 25 years after these photographs were taken, an American court awarded one of the largest judgments in legal history to the Rojas family against the heirs of the dictator Marcos, $22 billion. As Rojas told it, shortly after he discovered the Buddha, agents of Marcos raided his home and confiscated it. A media outcry ensued. Two weeks later, the Buddha was returned. After nine days, when they raided the house, they surrendered, the, uh, the military raided her house. They surrendered the Buddha at the Baguio City Hall, but it's fake, a fake Buddha. Rojas alleged a switch. This Buddha was made of bronze and its head did not detach. Rojas was arrested. Under duress, he retracted his protest. It was only 20 years later, after Marcos's fall from power, that Rojas felt safe enough to pursue the former president in court. 
He claimed Marcos still had the original gold Buddha and sued him for its return. Arlene Friedman was hired by Rojas's lawyers. Over a period of six years, she interviewed some 350 people associated with the Golden Buddha case. In the course of these investigations, she found a key witness. He'd seen the Buddha just after it had been discovered. So the first person I located was Kenneth Cheatham, who was in the military at the time. U.S. military, he was stationed in the Philippines, and he was a treasure hunter. And Roger's story hit the press, and so Kenneth Cheatham went over to Roger's house and took photographs of Roger and the Buddha. Yamashita's gold supporters used Cheatham's photographs to prove the authenticity of the Golden Buddha. And this establishes beyond doubt that the Buddha was real, that Roxas had it, and that this American intelligence officer was sitting there with him. But Cheatham himself says the photographs do not tell the whole story. Roger's brother wanted to show us where someone had drilled a, a hole in the bottom of it to, to uh, test the metal. And so it took three of us to turn the Buddha over and lay it down. And. Uh, so he, he showed us where this, uh, this hole was and said that it took uh, an hour for somebody to drill a hole that wasn't a quarter of an inch deep. So we knew that it was out of a very, very tough uh, metal. Gold is a soft metal. If Cheatham's recollection of the depth of the hole is correct, the Buddha could not have been gold. In no way was it gold. Uh, it, to me, it was uh, silver all over, sort of had a dull silver finish. Cheatham, however, was not called to testify on this point in court. Surprisingly, a member of Rojas's own family agrees with him. Rojas's brother, Jose, says that the Buddha wasn't gold and that there were no diamonds in the neck. When we approached Jose for an interview, he was reluctant to talk at least without a substantial payment. In turn, associates of the late Rogelio Rojas maintain that Jose is in the pay of Imelda Marcos. They claim nothing he says can be trusted. It's really unfair for him as brother to talk like that. And uh, we found out later that there's something wrong. There's an arrangement with the First Lady and Jose Rojas, you see, just to denounce that uh, it's, there's no really uh, golden, real Golden Buddha. But some say Umali himself isn't completely reliable. They point out that he's part of the group that supposedly discovered the Buddha. He has an interest in maintaining its authenticity. In this photograph, he's seen with what appears to be the original Buddha Rojas said he found. In this one, he's seen with the Buddha that was returned by Marcos's men. But have the photos been tampered with? Extraordinarily, the Buddha changes in the photo, but Amali's expression and body position remain exactly the same. The Golden Buddha case, like the whole Yamashita mythology, is a shady world of charge and countercharge, of bluff and double bluff. Despite the doubts and rumours, Rojas always maintained that his Buddha was made of gold and that Marcos stole it. Just before Rojas was due to fly to Hawaii to give evidence against Marcos, he died. His friends and family claim he was murdered poisoned by Marcos. Imelda Marcos and uh, my father, he eat a soup. After uh, four months, my father's here in the Philippines, then it's always vomiting. He died at Manila. Yeah. Yeah. How did he die? A poison. But the Rojas case was about to take a dramatic twist. 
a witness was produced who claimed he'd seen a Buddha identical to Rojas's in Marcos's now abandoned summer palace in the Philippines. A witness who helped swing the trial the Rojas's way. And who may be the key to the truth about Yamashita's gold. The Golden Buddha case, brought by Rogelio Rojas against the Marcoses in the American courts, revealed a web of intrigue in the Philippines. Rojas's lawyers had to prove that the Buddha found by their client was made of gold, and that former Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos stole it. As part of their case, they brought forward a treasure hunter named Robert Curtis. If you want to get to the truth about Yamashita's gold, you're going to come across the name of Curtis, an ex-auto salesman who started working in the precious metals business in the 1970s. Curtis's story is that in 1975, he saw a golden Buddha at Marcos's now abandoned summer palace a claim he repeated under oath to lawyers for Rojas. While you were there at the uh, Summer Palace, did you see any gold? Yes. Uh, where, in what form was the gold? Well, one was a Buddha and the other were bars. And where did you see a Buddha? In his office. That photograph contains a picture of two people and a picture of a Buddha with some rope around it. Uh, do you recognize the Buddha in that photograph? That's the Buddha that I saw on the floor of the Summer Palace. There's no question there could only be one Buddha like that. Curtis's testimony supported other evidence in the case for the Rojases. And in August of 1996, a court in Hawaii awarded Rojas's heirs one of the biggest damages judgments in legal history. $22 billion. The award infuriated the Marcos family. Imelda Marcos maintains that if the Buddha was so valuable, why had its country of origin not demanded its return? After saying that uh, we stole this Buddha, and there is no community in the world, there is no country in the world that is claiming this Buddha. The Rojas family hasn't collected a penny from the Marcoses. The $22 billion judgment has been massively reduced on appeal. The case continues. For the Rojases, the Buddha has been a curse. Henry, you seem quite nervous down here. Uh, yes. you just, just tell me why. Because uh, I'm very afraid to see at the other people to go here and maybe, uh, maybe I'm so nervous until now. <laughs> Is it still dangerous for you? Yes, sir. Why? I don't like to die. <laughs> I'm afraid to the Marcos group and also the government. Marcos was a villain. The list of people he harmed is a long one. Another who says he's owed money by the Marcos family is Robert Curtis. He says that Marcos had acquired a fortune in gold and that the dictator hired him to find more. During this meeting with the president, uh, he was trying to eliminate any doubts that I had. So um, the purpose of the trip was to show me gold. He asked General Bear to take me downstairs and show me some uh, gold that was recovered from one of his sites. Well, there was a hallway and uh, some guards at a door, um, which they opened up and I went in. And uh, there were gold stacked from floor to ceiling. I was amazed that they could get that much gold stacked up that high. Curtis says that Marcos and the treasure hunters had acquired maps to 172 Japanese burial sites. The story of where these maps came from and how Marcos's group acquired them is a romantic one. Morning, buddy. 
The version offered by Curtis and others is that the maps were left with a Filipino, Ben Valmores, at the end of the war. According to this story, Valmores had served as valet to the Japanese officer responsible for the treasure burials, Prince Takeda. Valmores is the key eyewitness. Uh, he visited the treasure sites. He went with his prince during the excavation, uh, during the loading of the treasure into the vaults, and then during the final inventories before the vaults were sealed. Toward the end of the war, uh, he went with Prince Takeda up to the northern end where they rendezvoused with a Japanese submarine, and it was arranged for Prince Takeda to be smuggled out of uh, the Philippines to Japan. He turned to Ben and he left his satchel full of original treasure maps with Ben, figuring that if the submarine were sunk on its way back to Japan, Ben would ob obligate himself to turn the satchel over to Takeda's family after the war. Hard evidence for Valmore's story is sparse. He no longer has the artifacts allegedly left him by the prince. He says that years of wear and tear destroyed the uniform and sword, and that the maps were taken from him by none other than Ferdinand Marcos. Marcos, he says, learnt of the existence of the maps. He dispatched one of his top treasure hunters, a Colonel Villacrucis, to get hold of them. Colonel Villacrucis see the map because he's the one who break the luck. And he says to me, Ben, this is a map of treasure. So I was surprised when he says that, that uh, that is a map of treasure. So I said, no, might be, I don't know. The Labour Group was the name of Marcos's treasure hunting team. It included Villacrucis and Valmores. Robert Curtis says that he was asked to join the group. His tasks, to decode the Japanese maps and to find the gold. Then, he says, he had to use his metallurgical knowledge to re-smelt the gold so that its origins were disguised. Curtis uh, was a success. He reverse engineered about eight sites, and one of them, the most celebrated, was called Teresa. Teresa II, actually, because there are four different Teresa sites on the same odd-shaped sugarloaf mountain. Curtis says that the Teresa site was selected as the first test of his engineering skills. Beneath it lay an underground complex built by slave labor. The Valmores maps indicated it held army trucks filled with bullion, solid gold Buddhas and precious gems. 60 feet down, Curtis claims they hit a Japanese booby trap. Curtis says Marcos's troops cleared the site as a safety measure, but he was never allowed to return. He admits that he never saw one gold bar removed from the ground. Shortly after, he says he was forced to leave the Philippines in fear of his life. On July. 1975, uh, uh, Colonel Lachica picked me up to take me to see General Bear and President Marcos, but instead took me to the uh, U.S. military uh, cemetery in Fort Bonifacio, where I was led to a group of rhododendron bushes, and I saw this hole in the ground, big enough to sit my body in, and. Uh, Colonel Chica put a 45 behind my ear and told me we're good friends, but I'm sorry I have to do this. Obviously, you're still here, so I assume the gun was not fired. Well, I'm a good talker. <laughs> were you able to talk your way out of it? Yes. And Amazingly, uh, I did. Did you then decide it was time to leave the Philippines? Wouldn't you? Yes. At that point, Marcos came in with his soldiers, and they removed only the gold that they found in the back of eight or nine army trucks that were in one of the tunnels. The amount of gold Marcos recovered 
was $9 billion worth of gold in 1975 values. After that, gold prices went way up. Back in the US, Curtis went public with his story. It was embarrassing for the Marcos regime and excited huge interest among treasure hunters. Curtis claimed to have photographed and then burned the original treasure maps before leaving the Philippines. He was now the key source of information about the supposed 172 sites. Few questioned his story. One of those who went along with Curtis was a much decorated World War II hero, Major General John Singlaub. Extraordinarily, Singlaub thought it would be a good idea not just to hunt for the gold, but to use it to help fund a dirty war supported by right-wing forces in the States. I was at the time very actively engaged in supporting the Nicaraguan resistance. I was raising money for that purpose. Uh, raising money in the United States had its limits uh, as far as support to a resistance movement. I could use it for humanitarian aid, but for the, for the military aid, I needed to raise the money outside of the country uh, to comply with our, our laws, the Neutrality Act. And I thought it sounded like a good source of, uh, of revenue if it really was legitimate. Sing Laub's group explored dozens of potential treasure sites, among them the fortress island of Corregidor in Manila Bay, which had been occupied by the Japanese in World War II. There were a variety of uh, sites that were listed among the 172 or whatever the number was of uh, sites that were supposedly used by the Japanese for the burial of this treasure, not all of it was gold bullion, but most of it was. Curtis indicated that gold had been buried in a major tunnel complex built by American forces before the Second World War. The story goes that the Japanese decided to put a significant deposit in some of those underground uh, tunnels. Uh, it would be easy to seal them up with minimum of amount of work and, and uh, observation. And I suspect that's the reason why they selected it. Sing Laub's group failed to strike gold or anything else except tons of dirt. Far from making money, they ran out of it. The Nicaraguan Contras had to fight on without their help. But others were ready to take their place in the queue. Curtis knew of one site all he needed was a sledgehammer to knock through one wall, and there was uh, approximately a billion dollars in treasure. And that was Fort Santiago. Ex-Green Beret Charles McDougald, an acquaintance of Singlaub, was the next to approach Curtis. McDougald, of course, hoped Curtis's maps would help make him rich but he was also a close friend of some important Filipino figures. Part of his pitch was that the gold would help bail out the Filipino economy. He started digging in the ancient Fort Santiago, which had been used by the Japanese as a wartime headquarters. So we went there, set up, all set to knock through this wall. We knocked through it and we find ourselves facing, I think, uh, a 14-foot square room with a 30-foot ceiling filled with earth. So there we were tunneling in the middle of this fort, trying to find where this treasure was, supposedly just on the other side of the wall, and that we would be digging all night and close up at dawn and go home. The treasure hunt turned into a public relations disaster when two Filipino workers were killed in a cave-in. About two weeks into the dig, uh, I think it was February 22nd, 1988, uh, there was a cave-in that killed two of our men. And we had to shut down the site and, of course, go in and get the bodies. 
As a result, we had to go public and uh, announce that uh, we were digging for gold there. A Philippine Senate hearing was set up and the project shut down. No treasure was ever found. Doubts about Curtis were now growing in the Philippines. You admitted that you have been the subject of a criminal case in the state of Nevada. Yes, I is this correct? That is correct. Uh, what was, will you name the uh, case uh, charged against you? It was wire fraud. I respectfully submit, Mr. Chairman, that any inquiry into the past history of my client would not be material. It would just be dragging the name of my client. I do not know for what purpose. Curtis was actually the leader of the group, and we didn't know at the time why he was scared to death of all this going on. And later we found out he was worried that they were going to find out about his past, that he had conned some people and that uh, he had been sued in court, I think twice. Gary Thompson spent over two years investigating the Curtis story in the early 90s. From the first day, it sounded too incredible to believe, uh, but he was able to produce documents that, that had some apparent validity to them, and it was an intriguing story. And uh, any journalist likes to tell stories and, and likes to get to the truth of a mystery, and what we wanted to do was see where's the, where's the real truth in this story. Over time, Thompson grew increasingly skeptical of most of Curtis's stories. During the course of his research, he discovered that Curtis had been convicted in a number of gold-related fraud cases. Most of what he told us about himself was fabricated. Uh, he claimed that he in invented the, the MasterCard, the bank credit cards. Uh, he claims that he was able to uh, take plain dirt and extract gold from it. Um, none of that was true. So there are a number of things about Curtis that raise serious concerns. The treasure hunters had placed great faith in Curtis. As they worked with him, they began to question their reliance on his stories. In my discussions with him, uh, I would find what I considered uh, gaps in his knowledge or his story didn't always match the story that he had given uh, someone else and he had, did not have a good explanation for that. Every bit of the Libra Group story that I checked out didn't check out. They claim the uh, maps were written in 2,000-year-old Japanese script. Well, there's no such thing. Uh, and on and on like that. Every, every claim they presented, I tried to check out, and I couldn't. Uh, I'm convinced there was a treasure there. Uh, I'm not convinced at all that there were exactly 172 sites or that they even had that many maps to back it up. And then we dug for 10 months and we spent $900,000 and we never found a thing. Yamashita's gold has attracted countless treasure seekers with the promise of immense wealth. It's doubtful that any have found it. Yet such is the lure of the gold that many still believe a major discovery lies tantalizingly just around the corner. And in 1996, their beliefs were reignited when news of an amazing find was splashed around the world. Yamashita's gold is a lucrative business in the Philippines, a business that is kept afloat by rumors of major discoveries somewhere in the islands. All too often, these stories prove to be a disappointment. But in April 1996, a Japanese documentary crew caught on tape a cave full of gold bars said to be worth over $150 million. 
For many, this was incontrovertible proof of the existence of the Yamashita treasure. I'd made several programs about the Philippines since 1987, and all throughout that time, I thought I'd like to do a program about the Yamashita treasure. Then, in the winter of 1995, someone brought me a videotape. I had a look at it and saw that it contained footage of several hundred gold bars in the jungle in the Philippines. As a result of that, I really wanted to get some film of it for myself. Until I saw the gold actually in front of me, I really didn't think it existed. But suddenly it was there, right in front of my eyes. My first reaction was, this is amazing. The documentary crew were given samples from one of the gold bars, which they took back to Tokyo for testing. The tests proved it was high-grade gold. But doubts have been raised as to whether all the gold bars were in fact genuine. Sunio Matsuzaki is a former Japanese TV producer and treasure hunter based in the Philippines. He maintains that the gold bars were probably fakes, the work of a Filipino crime syndicate. Uh, there's one particularly large syndicate whose boss I've been to talk to a number of times. That boss claims he's fooled over 2,000 Japanese. This syndicate has made so much money that they can afford to make real gold bars. They're made in the same moulds as the fake bars, and then these real gold bars are mixed in with the fake ones. These gold bars are the ones they offer for testing. Then once they've got their money, they switch the real bars for fake ones. So there are elements who are making large quantities of fake gold in order to fool people. From gold bars to treasure maps, what little proof there is of the existence of Yamashita's gold is tainted by doubt. But those maps that I have seen are generally what I would call fake maps fake in the sense that uh, they were not done by Japanese. Also, uh, some of the maps I've seen have the character gold very, very prominently displayed. And one who is trying to conceal gold is going to probably use another character as a secret symbol for gold. But why would you put on a map a character which says gold, and this is where the gold is, and I have arrows pointing to that. I think there's a cottage industry in the Philippines uh, to, to print maps, uh, to manufacture maps, to manufacture documents about gold deals. And the, the difficulty is in, in wading through all of these phony documents to find out which ones are real. I think one of the things that you have to use when you're looking at this is common sense. When you see documents relating to a gold deal for 100,000 tons of gold, that's not a realistic deal. What then is the truth about Yamashita's gold? There's no conclusive proof that the story of the treasure is true. Whatever gold bullion Japan did amass during its march across Asia, its scale may have been exaggerated, and it's probable that it was, in any case, long ago dispersed into the Japanese economy. The story of Yamashita's gold hovers somewhere in the triangle between history, myth, and deception. And some believe the biggest Yamashita deception of all may have been perpetrated by Ferdinand Marcos himself. After the fall of Marcos, reporter Scott Malone spent two years looking into his alleged fortune, said to be worth billions. 
Most of this fortune is alleged to have come from bribes, corruption and kickbacks. But Malone concluded that there was another possible explanation for much of Marcos's wealth. What it appeared that Marcos had done was melted down, re-smelted uh, Philippine Central Bank gold and turned it into your Mashta treasure. Marcos took the smelting technology from his American partners that he'd booted out, used his Filipino military treasure hunters to sell gold. It was said to be in 75 kilogram bars. And the most consistent story of people who actually worked for Marcos, like Colonel Velacruces and General Ferreira, was that they were 70, they were marked Sumatra, stamped Sumatra and AAA. The Philippines is a gold producing country, one of the largest in Asia. Malone's investigations revealed that in 1978, at the height of Marcos's power, all the Philippine gold mines were forced to sell their gold to the new central bank refinery Marcos had built. Malone had come across one possible example of how Marcos may have built his huge fortune. He found documents showing that between 1978 and 1984, 62 tonnes of gold were reportedly sent by mining operations for processing at the central bank refinery. But central bank figures showed they received only 55 tonnes. Seven tonnes were mysteriously unaccounted for. Seven tonnes, worth $58.6 million at current prices. Marcos did indeed meet with the treasure hunters, the Philippine treasure hunters, the Americans, the smelters. And then he, he more or less turned into a double-edged cover story. He encouraged the rumors of this incredible treasure to explain his own wealth, which appeared to be mostly stolen from the Philippine economy, Philippine government agencies, Filipino people. In reviewing all my, my files and documents, memos, um, I found only one person in a two-year investigation that ever saw one actual alleged bar of gold. Other than that, I found hard evidence, documentary evidence, of various people trying to sell gold, smelt gold, broker gold, loan gold, swap gold, and ship gold. But all that gold, almost to a T, the only real gold I ever found came from the central bank in one form or another, and not the so-called treasure of your Yamashita. Like gold itself, the story of Yamashita's treasure refuses to be tarnished. Even those who doubt most of the evidence still find it hard to let it go entirely. I believe that the truth underlying the story was that there was gold looted by the Japanese and that some of it was buried in the Philippines. But I think if you think, if you think about this logically, if you were the Japanese, would you bury this great hoard of gold, this alleged hoard of gold in 172 sites around the Philippines? No, you try and concentrate it in, in, a, in as few locales as possible, in a secure, a secure an area as possible, and as soon as possible after the end of the war, you would come back and make recoveries. It, it takes a lot of uh, rejection of the natural greed uh, desire uh, to uh, reject the concept of digging for treasure. My personal gut feeling is that there was treasure there. If it's a scam, it's very well thought out <laughs> and very well uh, choreographed. It's a wonderful, wonderful idea that you are involved in the greatest treasure hunt in the world. I got very hooked on it, I really did, uh, until I started looking at it rationally. It's a wonderful saga, it's Indiana Jones. You can sit in your armchair and say, I have a piece of an Indiana Jones saga. You have the Philippine community who is making an enormous amount of money by people going over there and looking for this treasure. They're hiring Filipino workers. This is a country that's starving to death. Investors' money is being spent in the Philippines. This behooves them to keep the story going. A lot of us, us, have gone over there and spent a lot of money looking for treasure. And I do not blame the Philippines one bit. I enjoyed myself over there. Uh, but we've contributed a lot to the economy. Now, we've dug a lot of holes, and I apologize for that. But uh, uh, we tried not to dig too many. Um, put a lot of people on the payroll, and we've left a lot of dollars over there. 
There's the treasure right there. All the treasure hunters that leave the dollars. 